This morning we're going to be doing a little review of the Gospel of Luke, the past uh, two or three chapters. And then I'm going to end with a, an illustration uh, from Jesus himself of what does it mean to live for the kingdom of God. But I start off with all the helps that we are being offered. At school, we have school counselors. We have academic counselors. We have financial counselors. We have all kinds of help. And throughout the world, we have different systems. In America, we have the welfare system, social security. Uh, in our society, in our culture, we have counseling centers. In the hospitals, we have all kinds of counselors. Habitat for humanity. Hospitals themselves are uh, to help people. Salvation Army, the Red Cross, orphanages. Countless of humanitarian systems by which we help you know, in Africa, here in America, wherever. And all those are designed to help human beings. Why? Because they need help. Just very basic. Why do they need help? Because we live in a fallen world. And there's no way around it. And we have all these systems. And, and they're all good. They, they, they're offering help. They're good. But they come short. They come short because they really don't deal with what happens after we stop breathing. They do not really attend to what happens after we die. Because see, after we die, then there's judgment. This is from the word of God, not mine. Then we have to face judgment. And so what does it matter if I help someone become a millionaire? And then after they die, they spend eternity away from God. We have to be realistic about those things. Now, people, many people believe that there isn't an afterlife. And okay, uh, I choose to trust someone that's been here from all eternity. I choose to trust God and his word. There is a judgment coming. Whether it's he comes now or after we stop breathing, there is a day of reckoning. And so I turn to the word of God to instruct me, to give me light. And so I pass this on to you. Because the greatest thing that we all need is what? To know God. To know the Lord Jesus Christ. To be connected to God in the right way so that we can live with him forever and ever. That need is above all needs. Above all needs. By way of introduction, I want you to turn, if you have your Bibles, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, by the way, sometime soon, we hope to be able to have the technology, we have the technology, we just don't know how to use it, to actually help you with the scriptures up here and all that, right? We're still adjusting. But 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1 and verse 18, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18, for the word of the cross, right, that Jesus came and died for our sins, rose again from the dead, for the word of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness. But those who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since the wisdom of God... The world through its wisdom did not come to know God. That's, that's the main thing, to know God, right? For God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews seek for, seek for a sign and the Greeks search, uh, search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God stronger than men. What's the point? It's the knowing of God. The knowing of God. That's where life is. And that is top priority for all of us. And I thank God that my brother did not give up on me. Keep preaching the gospel to me so that I would come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come to ourselves. What's your priority? 
in life? What's my priority? There's so many things tugging at us, right? And so many things that are being offered to us as solutions for life. The TV, the ads, the banks, the schools. Oh, education, education, education. Education is great. I've got a little education myself. But that is not the ultimate need for all of us. And so we come back to what is our priority? What are we most concerned about in life? Is it the kingdom of God? Is it the kingdom of God? Or is it that sport that I want my child to be in? That new race, that whatever. What are my priorities? God wants all of us to enter the kingdom of God. God wants all to enter the kingdom of God. But God gives all of us a choice. Whether we're going to accept or not. You see. And he wants to use us to be involved in that. He wants to use us to help others into the kingdom of God. Now what is this kingdom of God? Well, I mean, it would take sermon after sermon after sermon. But, in short, it is the will of God. Like it is in heaven, right? Thy kingdom come. Like when it's in heaven. And when God's will is done, guess what? It's absolutely beautiful. And, and, and awesome. And, and productive and strong. And God's will is done just like it is in heaven. Well, God's kingdom, one, God wants his will to be in each and every one of us so that we can be effective, powerful, beautiful human beings to help others. And God wants all of us to be a part of that, bringing people into the kingdom of God, into the will of God, to the rule of God. Are you involved in the kingdom of God? Helping others come into the kingdom of God? I mean, <laughs> you don't have to go to seminary and get up and preach and become a missionary, go to Africa and suffer. I mean, maybe the Lord is calling you, some of you to do that. But really to be involved in the kingdom of God is everyday relationships, everyday life within your own family, within your neighborhood, within your school, within your work, wherever you are. God is there wanting you to be helping others into the kingdom. Jesus came, and that's what he was about. <laughs> he communicated and communicated and communicated so that others would come along and be a part of this great work of God. I will praise you about thy kingdom. Didn't we read that from Psalm 145? Over and over, the kingdom of God. Because entering into the kingdom is salvation. It's salvation. You see, Christ came encouraging believers to help others into the kingdom. And what is this kingdom again? A relationship with God. Where we do His will and we are in relationship with Him. But there's the big problem, right? Of sin. And so when He came, He had to be uh, confronting that all the time. All the time. All the time. And he was resisted and resisted and resisted. Now, we've been going, uh, I think, a little over three years in the Gospel of Luke. And I think it's about time to do another little review. Um, I'm going to review chapter 17 through 19. Uh, and give some major points there. And that's where I wish right now we had the technology so I could show you up there. And uh, one of the days we will. And then after a short uh, review of those chapters, and very brief review, of course, uh, Jesus gives an illustration of what it means to be involved in the kingdom of God in the midst of opposition. In the midst of opposition. What does it look like? And we're going to see that in the last few verses of chapter 19. Chapter 19, verses 45 to 48. And I call that for the kingdom, even though I'm going to get hurt. But for the kingdom of God, because that's what people need. That's what you and I need. And that's what Jesus demonstrates. So first of all, let me, uh, a little quick review. And again, what's the purpose of this? So we can see Jesus' priorities. What should be our priorities? You see? We come to 
the first 10 verses of chapter 17, and we find here Jesus, uh, we are to obey Jesus' commandment to restore relationships His way. Really, uh, the first several paragraphs in uh, Luke 17, we find this, and this is again the, the point for you and for me, okay, that uh, believers are to gratefully, listen to that, gratefully trust Jesus to restore relationships by confronting and forgiving sin. Ooh, I didn't like, I didn't like that last part, did you? Confronting and forgiving sin. Do you have to do that? Now we have a world of full of uh, easy going, let's not rock the boat, let's just throw money into the problem, let's just be smooth and don't talk about sin. It's too condemning. It's too narrow minded. And Jesus says, no. The reason there's a hell is because of sin and we must deal with it appropriately. This is Jesus' way. And just as, a, as, a, as an example, as a, uh, I'm just going to hit verses that kind of hit that point. All right? Uh, we can't go through all of it. Uh, Luke 17 and verse 3 and 4. Luke 17 verses 3 and 4. Be on your guard. Why do you have to be on your guard? Because there's all kinds of systems by way to make life work that don't work. Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times saying, I repent, forgive him. That's Jesus' way. That's Jesus' way of how to build relationships, especially relationship with God. That's the beginning of it all. That we must come before God and say, Lord, I, I have sinned, forgive me. When there's a genuineness, God says, forgiven. Forgiven through the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that through the rest of the New Testament, right? But that's the very system, the very way that we are then to help others. Confront sin and forgive when there is repentance. It's relationship, right? And we're going to find at the end of this sermon where Jesus is the example of how to live for the kingdom in the midst of opposition, Jesus' priority is still going to be relationship with God. But in relationship with God, we must face, deal with what blocks relationship with God. Sin. And here we have the very first point in our reviewing from chapter 17 through 19. Believers are to be gratefully trusting Jesus as they, they work at restoring relationships, confronting sin, forgiving sin when there is repentance. Um, and then the next section, starting in verse 17, verse 20, and on forward, we have this. Suffering believers. I don't like that first part. You know, there's a lot of scriptures. I, I don't like it. But it speaks to me about reality. It's not the fantasy world that our, that our culture is living in. It's a fantasy world. You ever notice all the commercials? Oh my goodness, they're full of fantasy. They're fantastic. They make us laugh and they make us buy their stuff. Somehow they trick us and they get into our soul and we fall in. But it's all fantasy. It's all fantasy. Jesus cried and said, no, here's the reality. There's going to be suffering as you help people into the kingdom of God. And what we find in verse, uh, chapter 17, verse 20 and following is that suffering believers must trust God's character. Did you get that? God's character as they live for the kingdom. Why do I say, why do I emphasize the God's character? Because, especially here in the West, ourselves, we are driven by results. <laughs> we are driven by accomplishments of goals. Right? 
What are your goals? Write out your goals and push for those goals. And who, when you accomplish them, who success? Well, what were the disciples thinking when Jesus was crucified? Epic failure. Failure. They weren't looking at the character of God. And you and I have the same tendency. You see. We're driven by what the world, the evaluation and standards of the world, rather than the character of God. Then Jesus is saying, listen, as you live for the kingdom of God, there's going to be suffering. But you need to be trusting in what God is like. And again, I could, there's uh, tons and tons of theology here. And a couple of verses we'll have to do today. Luke 18 Verses 7 and 8. Luke 18, verses 7 and 8. Shall not God bring about justice for his elect who cried to him day and night? And he will, he will not delay long over them. I tell you, he will bring about justice for them speedily. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Faith. In the results, faith in the character of God. And so Jesus is saying, I want you to be a part of getting involved in what I'm involved in. What really, really, really helps people. Now, is there anything wrong with helping people with their physical, financial needs? Well, of course not. That's part of loving them. But ultimately, that is not the greatest the greatest is the gospel, the good news that God came down to save sinners like you and me. That's the greatest thing, you see. And in the midst of that, there's going to be suffering. Why? Because people will reject. And not only will they reject, they will become hostile towards us. They will actually attack. And those you young people that are in high school, junior high, are the ones that are the most keenly aware of that, I suspect. You start talking about the Lord Jesus. You start talking about the kingdom of God. You idiot. You, and they're going to attack you. And you know, you're very keenly aware. And for you, it takes a lot of faith. A lot of trust. And that's why... If I have the capability, I would like to be in 20 different places with 10, 20 different high school students, helping them, encouraging them to live for the kingdom of God. Because all else will fail. But there will be suffering. And there's going to be a need to trust in the character of God, not results. Let God do those results, you see. And He will. I can assure you, he will produce results. So that's what we have. Jesus came encouraging believers and saying, look, here's what you need to be involved. Be involved in getting people into the kingdom of God. You see, whatever else, be involved and be grateful about what he has done for us already. And that means confronting sin and forgiving sin when there's, when there's repentance. Now it's going to be, there's going to be suffering, so you must trust the character of God. And then chapter 18, verse 35, all the way through, verse, uh, through chapter 19, the point is this. And I'm tempted to go by every little paragraph, every little sentence that I wrote, because they're all important. But let me just summarize this whole section here. Believers are to be productive. Believers are to be productive, ministering to those who cry and live for Christ. You and I must be productive. That is, be involved in this and working for the Lord. Spiritual productivity may sound contradicted to you. On the one hand, don't look so much for the results and yet be productive. What does that spell? That spells faith. We have to live by faith that God is going to use us to produce. But we ourselves are not going by, who? how many people? Who? I have three notches right here on my belt today. I spoke to three different people. Oh, how many do you have? No. Uh-uh. 
We trust in God to produce, but we must be a part of that by faith. So believers are to be productive, ministering to those who cry and live for Jesus. Remember the blind man in Jericho? The beginning, uh, chapter uh, 19, um, starting in verse 35. Uh, we find uh, the blind man in Jericho and have mercy on me, have mercy on me. Be quiet, shut up. Have mercy. He cried even louder. He was crying for help. Jesus stopped and healed him. And everybody like, oops, I guess Jesus has power. Wow. Yep. And then the remember the rich man, Zacchaeus? Huh. Zacchaeus, he was corrupt, he was hated. This, you know, short little guy that just... Taking advantage of people. Everybody hated him. Jesus saved him. Man, if I've defrauded anybody, four times I'll give as much. I'll, he just followed the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus has the power. You see? Jesus has the power. And there, one was crying and the other one was living for Christ. And so that's what Jesus means to be productive. And listen... I don't know how many people I've talked to, and, you know, people don't, okay, I'm going to give a statistic, right, but I don't recommend it, but I'm going to do it anyway. If you talk to 10 people, if, you, if two of them respond well, man, you're doing good. You are doing good. Usually it's more like one out of 10, you know. Now, if you're three, you're next to Jesus. If three people respond good, man, you're an evangelist, you've got a special gift, something's wrong with you. <laughs> because listen, I, I really try, and by the time I know it, pew, they're gone. They don't want the things of God to actually live them out. That's the truth. I wish I was all successful. And I think, well, you know, eight or nine out of ten that I speak to, they trust. It's not the truth. It's not the truth. And so all the more that I have to trust in the character of God. But when someone does respond and they fall in love with Christ and they're following the Lord Jesus, oh my, how encouraging is that? Wow, that keeps me going. That's what keeps me going, seeing God at work in the lives of a few people. They really respond to the truth. You see. So. Jesus is saying. I want you to be a part of this. And it's going to be in the midst of opposition. And I want you to be a part of it. Because uh, I am coming back. And there will be judgment. And there will be no escape. Now let me give you an illustration. Of what that means. So now. We're going to cover the last four verses. Of chapter 19. The last four verses of Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 45. And um, he had already tried again. In the previous paragraph, he had tried again for the uh, religious leaders uh, of Jerusalem, the capital, supposed to be the spiritual capital, really, of the universe, because God was working there, and they had rejected, rejected just using religion. And Jesus said, try it again. He, how, how did we say the last time? He came in riding in a donkey. A small donkey. The size of a, of a dog, for instance. Totally unthreatening. Come on, trust. Nope, they rejected him. Oh. And Jesus is not giving up. He continues to help people enter the kingdom in the midst of opposition. Here's the illustration. Verse 45. And he entered the temple and began to cast out those who were selling, saying to them, It is written, and my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it into a robber's den. And he was teaching daily in the temple. But the chief priests and the scribes and the leading men among the people were trying to destroy him. 
And they could not find anything that they might do. For all the people hung on every word, on his words. So, Jesus enters the center of the capital, the temple. And he starts overthrowing throwing the tables. Throwing away those that are making money through religion. I mean, that's sinking lower and lower and lower. And Jesus comes and says, you're making money through my name? How dare you? And he starts throwing the tables over. And they were shocked. Why? Because here's the king bringing in righteousness. Bringing in righteousness. And that's what was going on. His zeal. He, well, he did not have zeal. Listen to this. Listen to this. He did not have zeal for popularity. Uh, isn't that the way today? How can I be more popular? Well, there's a lot of ways. But uh, one of the ways is to throw names around. Oh, I, my, my friend. Hmm. And I know, hmm, and I met, yeah, hmm. And by that, we're like, who get bigger. Jesus was not about popularity. Jesus was about righteousness. And he overthrew the tables. Cast them out. Now, you need to know that at that time, it was the Passover celebration. And people came from all over Israel, Right? And they uh, wouldn't bring the animal from North Galilee all the way through the mountains to get to Jerusalem. So they would bring money. But there were different types of money like we have now. Mexico, here in Texas. You go to Mexico, what do you do? You want to buy Mexican pesos so that you'll know how to trade and you come back and all this kind of stuff. And what happens? In trading money, they're money makers. I'll buy the dollar. I'll, buy, I'll sell pesos, whatever. But in that exchange, people are making money. And the money, those people they're selling, they were making money off of this. You see? And Jesus was saying, this is supposed to be a relationship with God. Not about making money. And so then he quotes from two Old Testament prophets. He quotes from Isaiah and he quotes from Jeremiah. I want you to look very carefully at what's happening from those passages that he quotes. First, Isaiah 56. Isaiah 56, if you have your Bible there, we, we won't, I can't spend a whole bunch of time, but uh, Isaiah 56, uh, Isaiah 56 starting in uh, verse 7, just to get the quote exactly from, Jesus, from what Jesus first says, uh, Isaiah 56 and verse 7, uh, even those I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. There it is. In my house of prayer. What's, about, what's that about? House of prayer? Prayer? Relationship with God. Prayer is about relationship with God. Remember how we started this message? It's about relationships. To confront and forgive sin when there's repentance. And that's what Jesus is interested in. How dare you in the temple that where people are supposed to be relating with God, you're making money off of that. It's supposed to be a house of prayer. And what was happening in Isaiah 56? In Isaiah 56, God was saying, look, all the nations, even the Gentiles are to be drawn to my house because that's where they're going to find relationship with me. Starting in verse 1. Isaiah 56, thus saith the Lord, preserve justice and do righteousness, for my salvation is about to come and my righteousness to be revealed. How blessed is the man who does this and the son of man who takes hold of it, who keeps from profaning the Sabbath and keeps his hands from doing any evil. Let not the foreigner, there it is, let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from the, his people. No, no, help the foreigner be connected. Neither let the eunuch say, behold, I am a dry tree. 
For thus says the Lord to the eunuch who keeps my Sabbath and chooses what pleases me and holds fast to my covenant. To them I will give my house and within my walls a memorial and the name better than that the sons of daughters and will give uh, them an everlasting name which will not be cut off. I want them to be connected with me. Also the foreigner who joins himself to the Lord to minister to him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servant, everyone who keeps from profaning the Sabbath and holds fast to my, uh, my covenant, even those I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar. For my house will be called the house of prayer for all the peoples. The Lord God who gathered the dispersed of Israel declares, yet others I will gather to them, to those already gathered. That's the purpose, you see. God wanted to gather everyone. And that's where Jesus quotes from. My house will be house of prayer. That's the purpose. It's better than any welfare. It's better than any habitat for humanity. It's better than any counseling in all the world. Connection with God. And that's where Jesus quotes from. That was the first quote. Now he goes to Jeremiah, the second part of uh, Luke uh, 19 and verse 46. Now the second part is from uh, Jeremiah. Jeremiah 7 and verse 11. Easy to remember. Jeremiah 7, 11. Jeremiah 7 and verse 11. This is where the second part of the quote comes from. And he says... Has this house, which is called by my name, there it is again, become a den of robbers? There it is. That's what Jesus is quoting from. And what's happening in Jeremiah 7? In Jeremiah 7, the Lord had confronted the people with false worship. They were trusting in deceptive words. Jeremiah 7, verse 4. Jeremiah 7, verse 4. Do not trust in deceptive words, saying... This is the temple of the Lord, the Lord of Lord, the temple of the Lord. Oh, that sounds really religious. Sounds good, doesn't it? Look at verse 8. Behold, we are trusting in deceptive, you are uh, trusting in deceptive words of no avail. In verse 10, then come and stand before me, this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered, that you may do all these abominations. In other words, they were saying, oh, we're Christians. We're saved. We're saved. God is saying, how can you be saved and be doing all these abominable things? Those, these ugly things. He was confronting the people that they were going by deceptive words. And all of that religion was being used to make money. You have made it into a den of robbers. Hello, America. Jesus has spoken and he has quoted the word of God. He said, for it is written. It is written. So much of today we're going by feelings. Who does it feel good? If it feels good, that's the truth. Deceptive, deceptive, deceptive way of living life. It is written, Jesus said, and he quotes, and he's confronting all these things. Now, he did that, you'd have thought people would have fallen down crying and repenting. Nope. Did not. Go back. Go back to Luke 19 and verse 47. What do we find there? What do we find there? Resistance, 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 opposition. Verse 47. And he was teaching daily in the temple. But the chief priest and the scribes and the leading men among the people were trying to destroy him. A couple things there. Did you notice that the Pharisees weren't mentioned? The Pharisees were not mentioned. You know why? Because the Pharisees in some way agreed with Jesus about the money making. They weren't there. The Sadducees did. They were making money. 
And so I can just imagine the Pharisees like, yes, but no, yes, but no, yes. They weren't there. But now I want you to add something, I want you to note something else there. Look at that. It says, and the leading men among the people, that's the first time they're mentioned. Like the popular leaders. Point. And in the original, they are left for the last part of the verse. Point. The main emphasis is on now the leaders of the people, the common leaders of the people. They were joining in in the opposition against Jesus. So it's not, it's not just the religious leaders now. It's just the popular leaders are also joining in the opposition. That did not stop Jesus. Should not stop you and me. We need to continue to trust in the character of God. Verse 47, and they could not find anything that they might do for all the people were hanging upon his words. Now, you know what that shows as well? <laughs> that shows that the, the quote-unquote leaders, they weren't really leading. They were not really leading. They were afraid of the people. Listen, when a leader is really leading, he will be willing to be crucified, but he's committed to what is right. He is going to lead whether they follow or not. And by the way, that occurs at every level. At the national level, at the state level, at the county level, at the city level, at the family level, at the friends level. If you lead in righteousness, it doesn't matter whether those follow or not. You need to lead in truth, no matter the opposition. That did not stop Jesus. I can already see some of you. Ooh, lots of applications. You can making a lot of connections. The way you should be applying it. But let me help you along. <laughs> Okay, I'll be general, so you don't have to be super convicted. First of all, we need to be valuing what God values. We need to be valuing what God values. Connecting people to God. That's what God values. He valued it so much, Jesus was willing to die for that. That's what God values. What's driving you? What's driving me? A good retirement? Good physical body? What's driving you and me? We need to repent and say, God, help me with my crazy values. And maybe you said intellectually, yeah, I value that, but then don't live like it. But then don't live like it. Words are cheap. We need to be valuing what God values. The kingdom of God. Bringing people into the kingdom. Perhaps this afternoon you can take inventory. What have I been fighting about? What have, have I been so afraid of? What paralyzes me? Is it the kingdom of God? Probably not. God forgive me. How many fights would be resolved if we realize we're fighting for something that's worthless? For something that really doesn't matter? So many of our fights would come to an end. God help us. God help us. Value the kingdom of God. Bringing people into God's will. Second application. Trust Jesus' character. Trust Jesus' character. Why? Because there's going to be opposition. Count on it. Count on it. You think that it's just going to be peace and 
smooth relationships because you love Jesus. And everything's going to be cool and copacetic and just, oh, it'll be smooth. It's not. There's going to be opposition against the truth. And in the midst of that, we need to trust that Jesus' character, He's going to bring justice. He is returning and He's going to look us in the eye. Did we live for Him or not? Did we trust in His character or not? We need to trust in Jesus' character in the midst of our opposition in this life. Then finally, what should motivate all of us? Connecting with Jesus ourselves. Connection with Jesus ourselves. And it's not just the initial start where we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as personal Savior. We have to do that. Because there's, He's the only way who, that He's the only one that died for our sins and rose again from the dead. So the first question is, have you trusted in Jesus as your personal Savior? And sometimes the way to look at it is, well, if I haven't been trusting in Jesus, what have I been trusting in? I have been trusting in my ability to talk, in my ability to lie, in my ability to kind of hide, in my ability to uh, imp uh, impress people, in my ability to whatever. What have I been trusting in? In my going to church all the time? In my reading the Bible, ooh, that's it, you know? And say, no, Lord, forgive me. You're the one that died for my sins. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's the word of God. But then, if you already trusted in Jesus as your personal Savior, it's an ongoing process of trusting Him. It's an ongoing process of being connected, having this dynamic relationship with God. With the Lord Jesus where I do something and the Spirit convicts me. And I say, Lord, forgive me. I need your cleansing, Lord. I've been a believer over 30 years. And I need Him every day, every moment I need Him. So commit to having this ongoing relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So that then we can be more effective for His kingdom. The Lord is a gentleman. Uh, don't we want people to be gentle with us in decision making? The moment any of us feel forced into something, what do we do? Our neck stiffens. No? Our pulse rate goes up. Come on, be honest. I mean, we, we, we don't like it. None of us like it. And so, mm, the more... We are persuaded with the right words, with love, with love. And the more likelihood it's going to be, God is that way. I mean, He sent the Lord Jesus with love. And He was gentle and then warning and then and He tried this way and that way and this way. Out of love, out of love. And so I want you to look at the Lord Jesus, not me. Look at what the Lord Jesus did in the text. And he kept trying and trying and trying. But the final appeal is, won't you trust Jesus? Won't you trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and your daily, daily King that you will submit and follow? Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for your word. We pray, Lord, that your Spirit would help us because... Well, we make commitments so quickly, Lord, and, but just as quickly we forget about them as well. So help us, Lord. Thank you for your word. Lord, we want to be a part of your kingdom and help people, other, other people into your kingdom. But oh, how we need you. Oh, how we need you, Lord. Be with us, Father. We come confidently because we do not come in our name. We come confident because we come in that wonderful eternal name of Jesus Christ. Amen.